Oh, <laughs> good afternoon. James Madison, fourth president of the United States. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to see you. I was just writing, copying a poem by my good friend and eventual political opponent, Alexander Hamilton. In yonder mead, my love I found, beside a murmuring brook reclined, her pretty lambkins dancing round, secure and harmless bliss. I bade the waters gently glide, and vainly hush the heedless winds. Then, softly be kneeling by her side, I stole a tender kiss. <sighs> the man had a way with words, and away with women. They loved him. They doted upon him. Why shouldn't they? He was brilliant. He was wonderful. What a man, full of confident vigor, intelligence. Together, Alexander Hamilton and I worked hard to create this country. Once successful, we then worked hard against each other to define what this country would be. Alexander Hamilton. What an extraordinary man. We grew up as complete opposites. He was born on Nevis, a fly speck of an island in the Caribbean in 1757. He was, as John Adams put it, the bastard son of a Scotch peddler and a poor mother. His father ran out on them when Alex was nine. His mother died when she was 11. I, by contrast, was the eldest son of the richest landowner in Orange County, Virginia. He had 5,000 acres, planted mainly in tobacco, with almost 100 slaves to work it. He lived until I was 48. My mother died when she was 98. Born in 1751, I was six years older than Hamilton. I lived the best of lives. I was only five foot four, 100 pounds, I was weak and given to strange fits that left me incapacitated. But other than that, I was a typical excited young man. Um, I had private schooling, and I attended the College of New Jersey and Princeton from 69 through 72 under the excellent tutelage of Reverend John Witherspoon, soon to be signer of the Declaration of Independence. Hamilton on the other side. He read whenever he could, whatever he could get his hands on, whenever he had a moment. At nine, he was employed by Nicholas Kruger's counting house. At 14, he was left in charge of the entire enterprise for four months, directing ship, evaluating merchandise, and, and reporting on the same. Upon his return, Kruger was so impressed with the talents and intellectual drive of this young man that he arranged for Hamilton to go to New York to attend college. The plan was that he was going to attend the College of New Jersey, just like me, but when he proposed to Reverend Witherspoon that he should take an accelerated course of study in two years instead of three, like I did, uh, the Reverend was not positively inclined. I had a bit of a breakdown after my studies, and I think he was concerned about that. King's College in New York City, now Columbia, they had no such compunctions, and Hamilton enrolled there in 1773, and he threw himself into his studies. Like me, Hamilton was a strong supporter of American independence, writing several articles of import that were published in some of the local newspapers. Unlike me, he possessed a hardy constitution, which, combined with his aggressive nature, uh, made him the perfect army officer. I was appointed to be colonel of the Orange County Militia, but my constitutional weaknesses proved inimical to the military life, and I betook myself to studies instead that I should be the best informed person on the issues of, of confederacies and republics so that when we were successful I should be there to guide us into a future existence as a nation. <laughs> Hamilton, quite to the contrary, <laughs> yes, 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 
he was uh, fully healthy and with the aid of some of his newfound, very wealthy friends, became captain of the artillery company in New York and after several actions he came to the attention of General Washington who took him on as aide de camp. During the war I first served in the Virginia House of Delegates, then in the Continental Congress. It was while I was in Congress that Hamilton took a leave from Washington's staff to get married, have his first son, and get appointed to Continental Congress, where he and I met for the first time in 1780. We were, in many respects, birds of a feather. We both saw with clarity that Congress was not getting the work done, uh, most particularly with respect to money. Congress would set the contributions each state was supposed to make to support the war effort, and the states would then send whatever was convenient, perhaps a tenth of the request, perhaps nothing at all. The Battle of Yorktown would not have happened if Robert Morris had not borrowed money on his own account to amass enough to send the troops down to the peninsula. Now the, uh, um, the Battle of Yorktown was also Hamilton's moment of glory. When he returned to the army, not as part of General Washington's staff, but as a field officer in command of a regiment on the front lines, <laughs> As a young man, Hamilton dreamed of war, like so many others. War presides opportunity for young men of character and determination who are without wealth. It is only by leading men into combat that one's valor may be fairly determined. And Hamilton wanted that. He did not merely lead his men into combat. He inspired them. He made them proud. He made them angry. He made them brave to the point of stupidity. He led his men in order of drill on the parapets above his trenches in full view of the British. When he was ordered to take a redoubt protecting the British position, his men came on so fast that they overtook the sappers who were supposed to be blowing up the obstacles so they could... And preparing the way. The man was aggressive beyond belief. I completed my three-year term in Congress and returned to Virginia and the House of Delegates. During this time, the finances of the United States fell into even worse condition. Despite winning the war, we were losing the peace. Trade was badly impacted by the restrictions the British had placed on what ports American ships could trade at and the cost thereof. Specie, gold and silver, was in short supply. Europe would not offer our merchants credit as they did before. It was specie or nothing. Added to this was the demand for taxes also in specie, effectively bankrupting many of our farmers. Things were horrendous. With the end of the war, Hamilton, <laughs> Hamilton, <laughs> With the end of the war, he decided upon the law, and after several months of intense study, he passed the bar and quickly became one of New York City's most sought-after lawyers. Let me repeat that. After several months of intense study, he passed the New York bar. The man was a genius. While studying, he wrote an extensive note, set of notes which were later published as a study guide for future students. Although many of his more insightful comments, such as, <clears throat> there seems to be no logic behind this procedure, were elated. <laughs> 1786, things were a mess. Not only was our economy in ruins, but the states were bickering about all sorts of issues. Virginia and Maryland were verging on warfare over wider water rights on the Potomac. A conference which we held in Annapolis to resolve the disputes attracted only five states. Left most of us depressed. But not Hamilton. He used this, 
the clarion call for convention to write a new constitution. This suggestion did not sit well with Congress. So I took my young friend aside, I was 35, he was only 29, and I gave him some advice about subtlety and men's pride. He rewrote the proposal to state that <clears throat> an adjustment to the federal system was necessary. Now, one way of adjusting the federal system is to throw out the Articles of Confederation and write a whole new constitution, uh, but we didn't have to tell Congress that. They approved our conference. Now all we had to do was get the states to show up. Inasmuch as only five states came to Annapolis, what made us think that we could get all 13? George Washington. If there was one thing the United States agreed upon, it was George Washington. He had come from his plantation to lead his victory in the war, then he resigned his commission and went back to have his plantation. The very definition of a Cincinnatus. Cincinnatus was the Roman statesman who had left his plow to save the city and then returned to his farm relinquishing all power. This became the classical definition of uh, civic virtue. The, the, revolutionary offi the revolutionary army officers even formed a society called the Society of the Cincinnati with George Washington as its first president. General Washington was leery of our convention. He was very particular about maintaining his sterling reputation, and the thought of getting mixed up with the rat's nest of defining a new constitution did not sit well. Revolution is easy. Governance is hard. Still, he was my friend. We had worked extensively together during the war. He often looked to me for political advice. So, although he would not make a formal statement that he would attend, he made it clear that if we got all 13 states, that he would be interested. And of course, that is all I needed. I did not have to state explicitly that the general would come. I merely needed to make it clear that he expected the states to send a delegation. And when the greatest living man on earth expects you to send a delegation to a convention, yes. I did the lion's share of the recruiting and netted 12 of the 13 states. Only Rhode Island, which we sometimes refer to as Wrong Island, <laughs> refused to send a delegation. The Constitutional Convention opened on the 25th of May, 1787. Over the next three and a half months, 55 different men would participate in discussions and debates in Philadelphia. At the end, we had a document of some 4,400 words, signed by 39 of the 55 men who attended. I shan't go into any detail on the conference, Suffice to say that I had written an outline for a constitution, the Virginia Plan, which we then refined into the document that you know so well. Although we managed to agree on the major structures of government, we from Virginia lost on three major issues. I wanted the Senate to be apportioned by population. Instead, it is two per state. I wanted the legislature to have a nullification over laws in states. Instead, we have a vague notion of states' rights. And more than anything, I wanted an end to slavery. Instead, we got an end to the importation thereof. You may notice that there are no hereditary rights in the Constitution, nor are there any property requirements or wealth requirements for office. We, the elite, thought of ourselves as a natural aristocracy. The reason that we were wealthy and powerful was because we were simply better and smarter than the 
average person. Hamilton was proof of this. He was talented, so of course he rose the level of his talent. And people who were born with wealth, without talent, they would soon lose their wealth. Therefore, we did not need to put any such requirements into the Constitution. The Constitution, all men really are created equal. We didn't get everything we wanted, but we got the most important thing, union. We were going to be a country. We were not going to become Europe engaged in eternal warfare. I don't need to point this out to you, but in the Napoleonic Wars, France lost more men than the United States has lost in every war it has ever fought combined. That is what we were terrified of. What was it this Hamilton said as we were signing the Constitution? No man's ideas were more remote from the plan than mine. But is it possible to deliberate between anarchy and convulsion on one side and the chance of good on the other? We would gladly accept a compromise for a chance of good, then lose it all. I was, in large part, satisfied with the results of our labors, and content to return to New York and finish the Congressional session. It seemed clear that the states at their ratifying convention would support the Constitution and vote for it. Hamilton was a less sanguine than I, and began to write a series of articles in New York newspapers supporting the ratification. Several letters had already been written in opposition. <sighs> he enlisted the help of John Jay, soon to be first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Jay wrote five articles and then fell ill. So Hamilton turned to me. Between the three of us, we wrote 85 articles over a period of several months. At times, we would be in the printer's office, finishing one article while he was setting the type for the beginning of the article. It was an exhausting but exhilarating time. It was an unbelievable effort, but produced the best analysis of constitutional government that has ever been written. We later had the articles printed up in the Federalist in book form here, so that we could distribute it to our friends. It was a wonderful time. New York is lovely in the spring, you know. Alexander and I would walk along through the city talking. I lived on Maiden Lane, he on Wall Street. On our way to Federal Hall, we would walk and talk about all of our hopes, our dreams for a new country, how we would inspire others to support it, how we would make a better world. As spring 88 ran into summer, I was called back to Virginia. Patrick Henry was a firm opponent of the Constitution, and it wasn't clear that Virginia would ratify. When I left, Alexander and I set up an express rider between Poughkeepsie and Richmond to keep each other informed of the progress in our respective conventions. Eight states had already ratified. Technically, we only needed one more, but practically, we needed both Virginia and New York on board. Rhode Island and North Carolina, eh. New York and Virginia were both evenly divided. The outcome was completely unknown. I had to contend with Patrick Henry. He had to contend with Governor George Clinton. Both conventions discussed the Constitution in great detail, which was to our advantage. We were able to discuss why we made the choices we made and the consequences of not making those choices. And we also made a very good use of the Federalists. Nonetheless, Patrick Henry was a mesmerizing speaker and a formidable opponent. I was good with logic, but it is hard to sway a man with mere logic. Over the course of three weeks of discussion and session, I worked hard out of session 
talking quietly to people, explaining the importance of our making this decision. If we did not ratify, we were going to go to war with Maryland. We won by a slim margin of 10 votes. This, in turn, was enough to push delegates in New York into our camp, and a month later, New York ratified. It was an incredible accomplishment. Back in New York City, the citizens were delirious with joy and celebrated with a massive parade featuring this, a 27-foot frigate built on a cart and hauled through the streets, appropriately christened the Hamilton. Behold the Federal Ship of Fame, the Hamilton we call her name. To every craft she gives employ, sure Cartman have their share of joy. Alexander himself was still in Poughkeepsie finishing paperwork. He did not get to see his ship. But there it was, we were a nation. We were the largest self-governing nation that had ever existed in the entire world. We now had a chance to make true the promise of 76. That all men, indeed all people, are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure.